all right we've learned about different materials and components in different conditions we've learned how they come together to make circuits for things like torches or fans we've learned their symbols are we ready to start making flame throwers yet well no that comes later Making a circuit isn't exactly as simple as throwing together a bunch of components and attaching a battery in the hopes that it might work out. I know this cuz I cuz I learned it the hard way. <laughs> there are rules to how you make a circuit and how it should work. And that's basically what we're going to be looking at today. Electric circuits work on one central theme, the transfer of charge and energy. And that's where Kirchhoff's laws come into play. and we've talked about this earlier about the conservation of charge and energy in closed circuits a really simple and straightforward way to look at this would be that charge or energy can't exactly be created out of thin air and and they can't disappear into thin air either now kirchhoff has two laws the first one deals with the conservation of charge and the second deals with the conservation of energy let's start with the first Let's imagine you have a junction in a circuit where multiple wires are meeting. Now, according to this law, the total current leaving the junction is equal to the total current entering the junction. So, if we have a junction with 3 wires and you know that the current in wire 1 and wire 2 is 0.5 and 1.5 amperes respectively. Kirchhoff's first law lets us determine the current in wire 3 with this information alone. In this case, it's 1 amperes. And here's where things get a bit more interesting. Stay with me here. Since charge can neither be created nor destroyed within a circuit, the current entering a component is the same as the current leaving the component. So the component isn't using up current. And the charge carriers entering a component each second are equal to the charge carriers leaving the component each second. So if we take this and apply this to series circuits, with the current entering each component being the same as the current leaving that component you could also say that the current before and after a set of components connected in series should also say the same right the current shouldn't change and obviously we're not just going to come up with theories and not test them right we have to prove it so here's what we do we create a circuit with multiple components in series and ammeters set up at different points As soon as the switch is closed and the current starts flowing, you will see that the ammeters all show the same reading. So, there's our proof. Now for Kirchhoff's second law, that is conservation of energy. Here he says, the total energy in a closed circuit must be conserved in such a way that the total EMF provided by the power source is equal to the total potential difference in the circuit. Look at it this way. If the charge carriers lose energy as they flow through a component, we call it a potential drop. And when they gain energy, for example, when they pass through a battery, we call it a potential rise or the electromotive force EMF of the battery or power source. Now the total sum of these potential drops and rises in a closed circuit will equal to 0 because energy is conserved, right? It can't be created or destroyed. In other words, The electron does work in moving through a component while the battery does work on the electron itself giving it energy and in a closed circuit these two amounts of work done will be equal so for example let's say we have a circuit with a battery and three resistors in series each coulomb of charge from the battery will deliver energy to each resistor as it flows through the circuit and that's basically what causes potential differences across these resistors right so with kirchhoff's second law We know that the potential difference across the battery terminals is equal to the sum of the potential differences across the three resistors. Got it? Now let's say we change the circuit and add two of the components in parallel instead. What happens now is that the potential drop across both components will be the same. Think of the two resistors in parallel acting as one. This is because charge carriers can only pass through one of the two components, right? So regardless of which resistor they pass through the charge carriers will still deliver the same amount of energy. Pop quiz time. Picture this. A circuit with a 6 volt battery and 3 resistors. Resistor A 
is attached in series with two volts of potential difference across it. Resistors B and C are attached in parallel to each other but in series to resistor A. So what's the potential difference across B and C? Go back to the two Kirchhoff laws. Since the battery gives 6 volts of increase in potential, the total decrease in potential must also be 6 volts, right? Because it has to have a net zero. So, if resistor A has a potential difference of 2 volts, the combined potential difference of resistor B and C has to be 4 volts. Obviously, right? But that's the combined difference. What about the individual resistors? Well, again, in parallel connections, charge carriers can either pass through resistor B or C, right? And again, regardless of which one they go through, they'll still deliver the same amount of energy. So the potential difference across either resistor, B or C, will be the same 4 volts. Alright, just one more example. This time we look at how parallel resistors impact power. Let's say we have a circuit set up with two bulbs in parallel. One bulb draws 6 watts of power, while the other draws 24 watts. And they're both connected to a 6 volt battery. So now your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to figure out what the current through each bulb is and what the total power output of the battery is. Now since the bulbs are connected in parallel to the battery, the charge carriers leaving the battery with 6 volts of EMF will either go through the 6 watt bulb or the 24 watt bulb, right? Which means both bulbs will have 6 volts of potential difference across them. Since we know the bulb's power ratings, we can use the formula P equals to IV to find the current through each bulb. So the 6 watt bulb will have 1 ampere of current flowing through it, while the 24 watt bulb will have 4 amperes flowing through it. Alright, we know the current for each bulb now. But how do you calculate the total power from the battery? Well, we're going to use Kirchhoff's first law to find the total current from the battery. And for that, we'll have to look at this problem in terms of the junctions. Since the junction between the two bulbs has 1 ampere of current flowing out towards the first bulb and 4 amperes flowing towards the second bulb. So the total current flowing into the junction has to be 4 plus 1, which is basically 5 amperes. And the same goes for the junction on the opposite end here. The current from the two bulbs will be 1 amperes and 4 amperes. So the current out of the junction and towards the battery should be 5 amperes. Great! We know the voltage, 6 volts, and we know the current, 5 amperes. Now we use the power equation to get the net power, which is 30 watts. And if you think about it, this makes sense, because the total power given must be equal to the power consumed. And 24 watts plus 6 watts is 30 watts. So yeah, problem solved. Mission accomplished. Congratulations. Okay. Now we may not yet be at the level where we get to design our own flamethrowers, but we can use these rules and start to make our own circuit diagrams. Or at least be able to determine the specific values of current, potential difference or power in other circuit diagrams. There may still be a long way to go before flamethrowers, but we'll get there. Don't worry. You just gotta stick around for it.